we've been saying for a long time that we needed to go visit Dan Robinson at Alandon Gardens. And finally, the team and I were able to make the trip to Bremerton and spend some time inside of his garden, spend some time with his family, and spend some time with Dan one-on-one, really trying to dissect his very unique perspective and approach horticulturally to the concept of stasis in bonsai and aesthetically to representing the concept of ancient. Now, I want to just put a disclaimer on this that Dan is a very unique individual that kind of blazed his own trail in the bonsai practice and deviated from the traditional model significantly. He's gonna say some things that stray far from the way we approach bonsai at Mirai, but there's interest in this. There's a different pursuit in this. There's a different goal to Dan Robinson's actions with bonsai. And inside of that, there's something to be learned. There's something to stimulate thought. There's something to present possibilities. There are pieces to Dan's approach that could be considered and potentially added to create more value or enhance what it is we're already doing inside of the art form. This is the role of an artist, to expand the way we think and get us outside of the box. And there is probably no other single individual in the bonsai practice that sits on the outskirts of town as Dan says himself, in the action of bonsai. We invite you all to sit back, relax, take it with a grain of salt, but allow yourself to just think about your intention in bonsai as Dan dissects and breaks down how he's approached this art form over a very prolonged and illustrious career. Enjoy. As a kid, we lived in Hollywood and North Hollywood and and I, um... I love Thompson seedless grapes. They'd come in these big bundles and I used to eat all the grapes off and then I'd look at the, what was the remnant that was left and here's this gnarly tree type shape of right. dead branches. You know, just. Interesting. And I remember uh, once driving from Chicago to, to Topeka, Kansas for a, for a Christmas deal or something, family was down there and I I, the inside of the car had fogged up. We were in a Nash Rambler or something like that way back in 53 or something like that, drawing a, a picture in the, in the moisture like an old oak tree. Uh, so oak trees have always kind of consumed my enthusiasm. And I, you know, I was enamored over the vertical giant trees here because um, that's what was here. And as a kid, you know, I spent summers down here in Grapeview, which is 20 miles south of here on the beach and mm. endless driftwood, gnarly root things that washed up and big logs from the logging. Everything was transported by water early on. And yeah. so there was all this drift out there. Plus there was the stuff that fell off banks and everything else. So there is hardly any out there now, you know, because yeah. people clean it up and yeah. scour the beaches. I mean, the beaches were buried under slanting trees of varying degrees of prostration. So these guys are down covered with barnacles. And then the next level is right along the tide level. And then these are up a little bit more. And then, right. and I remember walking along those beaches and climbing over all these logs and you never really saw the beach. It was, and now they've cleared it all off so it's nice and sunny and pea gravel. Yeah. And, yeah, well, there you go. And so trying to even find a place like that on Puget Sound here, I mean, they've, they've allowed people to build houses on sandbars with septic tanks. Hello, Earth. Where mm -hmm. do they think that stuff's going? Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, what's the brain trust? Yeah. Oh, so anyhow, like I said, when I got on that train going down to my duty station in Korea and looking out the window and every pine tree was informal, upright, pines all along the railroad track and you never saw that <laughs> in western washington yeah you get up high enough to run into snow loading right you know so right so and you don't know why that was that way in south korea i don't it must be a congenital thing because all of the little forests i don't know that they're little but second well they've got to be occasionally you'd see a giant pine that of course was look like a giant oak because mm -hmm. that's how all of them wind up mm. You know, the great, uh, the best of the ponderosa pines and rocky things are gnarly, huge canopied things. And yeah. I was west, west of Miami, 
over on the west side. Mm -hmm. All those great pines, probably loblollies or long needles, whatever or they are, like that. Yeah, all of them have huge, gnarly limbs festooned with orchids mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But they all look like giant oak trees, right? To me, rather than than this. Yeah. And so and then to get into those swamps up there, and here's pine trees growing along the ground because it's too acidic, mm -hmm. producing weak wood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, but, but I, I, you know, it's almost like everything led to the same point for you because, uh, because it all came down to this, like, um, well, just infatuation. It, it yeah, all. but well, but but the infatuation was it, it was it was the uh, it seems to me it was the impossibility of it. You know the the improbability of it or the. Well, it could be that that's what would be so seductive. I mean, it's like that one I showed you down there where the bark is growing through the knot hole mm -hmm. back inside the hollow trunk. Right. It's just un, un uh, unworldly. Yeah, I, I've never seen that before wow. on a, in a bonsai, honestly. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting because I have seen that before in China hmm. on some of their old elms. Oh, yeah. In okay. uh, some of their uh, bonsai garden. We, I've been to China probably four or five times, and hmm. we led tours over there. And, you know, Diane did all that kind of stuff, and I was carrying baggage but that's okay I, I <laughs> you added, were there i added you were some there. baggage to it there you go and uh and i saw that on some of those chinese elms mm -hmm. and i'm not sure whether they were artificially carved out or whether it just ultimately failed because some wood is pretty undurable if there's a you know a dead face on the tree it may just rot away and then if the outside's okay it could yeah could swell back, but to find a natural one like that is just kind of a kiss, you know. It, yeah. And um, I, I feel like, yeah, it's almost like may, maybe, uh, you know, the pinging model, I feel like is like we look at wild trees more and more. You know, it's a progression. It's been a progression for me. I, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. be, because I because I did grow up in the Rockies, and I when I went to Japan, I went to Japan to learn Mr. Kimura's technique. I sure. didn't necessarily want to take on... <laughs> The bonsai, the bonsai aesthetic, stereotype. you know, but, yeah. but it's tough to not be institutionalized to a degree when you're an, oh, an indentured yeah. servant. And you got it. Got and it. How do you evolve? That's after the, that? and that's, that's the where, question. where you're in. Yeah, but, and, and it's but like you me, got I'm there. I'm still evolving with planting trees more than ever if I can, plant them in a rock. Yeah. And so, uh, but my design things are ostensibly kind of the same. I want, you know, my, I'm, I'm, I was accused once of being unprincipled, and so I decided I'd have some principles. So I thought up, you know, four of them, and and I ascribe to that. It's the Robinson addendum. It's, uh, you know, all trees <laughs> deserve crooked, gnarly branches. All trees deserve dead wood, but it should be carved and refined so it's value added. Mm -hmm. You don't want any bullseye pruning scars. That's number three. And wire should be everywhere except where you don't use it. Mm. And so, oh, oh, that's it? Well, I can expand endlessly on those, yeah, of course. those concepts, but it's down to that kind of a thing. Um, I always considered that most bonsai stuff is, is crafty. You know, branches should depart the trunk, come down, and then level out. And that's only because I understand how trees expand and bury branches that have this shape. And when you found it, the trunk was out to here and they all leave there and it looks more better. Right, right. And so it's just kind of an extrapolation from the visual observation of things and growing up luckily at a time when there were a few of those around yeah. to see. And, and I, was, I was just back in Raleigh at the Triangle Bonsai Club back there for five days two or three weeks ago. And they just all got done with the, the spring ritual of repotting. I said, well, good luck to you guys. You know, count the dead or dying a little later. <laughs> You'll know by June, I told them. <laughs> June's when things show up. You know, you can transplant all winter long. Sure. 
Man, and it'll die in June. <laughs> if it's if it's gonna if it's gonna die, yeah. the summer is generally where it gets yeah, tested. That, yeah, that's when it's uh, the demise is evident. <laughs> Anyhow, they wanted me back there to uh, to show them how I carve and what I do with that stuff, and um, so it was great fun. I just spent had two workshops and a demo and worked on the Yopon Holly. That was just fabulous, hmm. big old errant thing and just reduced it down to this stuff and it you know trunk this big and of course they hadn't uncovered the nabari and it's there yeah. just lump, get these get these little roots off of here look at this you know and, yeah and but it was great to uh, to motivate and to free up maybe to set free the notion that deadwood is really okay on, on deciduous trees yeah it's there. Mm -hmm. So why is it wrong? Yeah. I mean, where does that come from? So much of the regimen was written by this guy, was a, a GI who after the war was still in Japan, he was walking around and saw these guys out on the street making little bonsai trees. And he said, I had to write a how-to book. And let's see, what would I put in there? Well, I'll look at this guy's trees and okay, he's got a first branch, okay. All bone size should have a first branch. And then, oh, then there's a second one and it's slightly higher and opposite. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, second, third. Oh, and then you do it again. And then it goes up to a triangle, perfect. Is this actually what, how, how these conventions started? I have no idea, I but I can't imagine that they came. I've never quite understood it. Source because so much of it is just kind of you mean you got to do this? Yeah. And got to do that when you're looking at Mother Nature? But it's an art, for God's sake. It has nothing to do necessarily with Mother Nature. So this is the, this is the conundrum in a way is that all of it is good. Mm -hmm. You're working with plants and having them thrive and grow, and they're producing oxygen, for God's sake. Yeah. Which is really nice to have. It's good. Some of that. All positive. You know? And it's all real close, and you're a lot better off breathing this oxygen than the stuff that's downstairs in the basement in New York place where everybody else has breathed it before you did. Right. And it came from the exhaust pipe of a truck. Yeah. To boot. So, like I said, I, I look at all of the various expressions and think, of, oh, it's laudable, it's fabulous. Do it. Mm hmm because there's so many people that do nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, then you start getting into the politics of our society and how wonderful everything is, and boy, it's scary. So, you know, you don't want to <laughs> touch too much on that. Yeah. I mean, I don't go collecting in the front range anymore because it's all been burned. Yep. And all the little trees go, of course. Right. And um, here's the U.S. government deciding that what we need to do to save the f uh, to put the fires out, I mean, this is the blindness. To put the fires out, we've got to go in and clear all the underbrush and young trees out of the woods around the world so that all these dumb people can still go out and start fires in the woods. Yeah. You know, today we walked through Landon and every tree has had a story you know yeah. and, I, and I understand and that from all my own experiences from out there. yeah yeah and, and yeah. getting to sit here and look at the white pine which is a total anomaly yeah. in the middle of a body of water for a western white pine <laughs> yeah. to be existing there there's no reason that that tree should live there and like yeah. and yet this is your setting yeah yeah this is your every day bizarros but it's that, but it's it's not it's not that bizarre. This would be this would have been normal, right? At at yeah. one, at some point, this would have been normal. But now this is a unique situation. This is a unique scenario. Maybe that's illustrative of the change that yeah, you're speaking to. Maybe yeah. you yeah. know. That's true. Ira, can I have one of those red ales? Red. Yeah, this is where red ales. R Ridge top. You don't you don't drink beer. No. Uh, Did you ever I drink don't even beer? Drink coffee. You don't drink coffee? No. It's a killer. Are you really? It's caffeine. Do you are are you are you just just I water, huh? It tastes like shit. Why? You know, <laughs> I drink pog, which is a fruit juice, 
kind of mixture of mango and another thing and another thing and that's good and I drink water. Uh-huh. Have you always been that way? Yeah. I never drank pop, although I would drink, um, when I drive to, uh, to go collecting, um, I'll drink a Pepsi, one of those big ones, yeah. with sweet and low in there to get rid of the carbonation. And I won't blink for 800 miles. Wow. I mean, boy. So that, you know, just kind of it's a go juice. being functional. The go juice. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the caffeine in there, I guess. I don't like anything that tastes bad. Okay, so I, I hate hot well, I, food. I don't like anything that tastes bad either, um, but this doesn't you know, taste anything bad. That's got, uh, this doesn't taste bad, though. That's the, well, that's yeah, but debatable. you had to like it. Huh? You had to learn to like it. And the same thing with smoking hmm. or coffee. I mean, the first time you tasted it, it was just kind of... And you drink this with enthusiasm? Yeah. Yeah, how, how, but how do you learn to like, you know, like the first time I ate sushi, I was like, ah, I'm not into that. And then for me, I started thinking about it a little bit and I was like, well, maybe it wasn't so bad. And then, and then it was like, actually, maybe I kind of like that. And it just sort of naturally morphed. And I speak to sushi specifically because it morphed inside of my head and I was very mm -hmm. observant of my shift yeah. to going from disliking the first time I ate sushi to wanting to eat it the second time. Yeah. You know, that well, was a very I, I odd like transition. It, uh... I didn't like the idea of eating it raw for some reason. I'm not sure that there was a taste that bothered me because mm -hmm. it's just kind of fish. I mean, uh, the thing that kills me is the green stuff you put on it that burns you to eat it. So I'm, I don't like anything hot in food. Uh huh. I like food to be warm, but I mean the, the yeah. spices. You don't like so the wasabi, I'm kind of an huh? anti-spicy kind of guy. I like my steaks rare and a lot of salt on them. Uh -huh. I love sugar. I love milk chocolate. Dark chocolate's the enemy. <laughs> yes. And yes, I is. like it's walnuts better terrible. than uh, than almonds. But you don't seem to find them in chocolate anymore. And so from a food standpoint, I can eat just about anything. There's just some things that I don't like it hot, like hot chili and stuff yeah. that burns going down. I can't yeah. understand that in people. And it's the same thing with drinking coffee or smoking a cigarette. Think about the first cigarette you tried. I tried one in Chicago, I guess, and I almost fell in front of an elevated train. And uh, then I tried to learn how to smoke when I was working Eastern Oregon Forest Service before my freshman year in college. And I bought a pack of cigarettes. I had it rolled up in my T-shirt up here, you know, mm -hmm. Marlboro, man. I think I got a couple puffs and I thought, God, this is really stupid, isn't it? Why do that? Yeah. I remember when you had to drink beer, when you'd go to a party over at Lake Chelan and everybody's out there and I, the best I could do is uh, carry Kool-Aid with me and I'd put it in the beer so that it would sweeten it up and, mm -hmm. and but it just it was this machination trying to make it so that I could kind of fit in and I just decided I just didn't have to fit in anymore and so. When did you decide that, that you didn't have to fit in anymore? Well, it was probably a long, long time ago. Back, um, back in the late 60s, probably. Hmm. Probably earlier than that, when it came to bonsai, just because it seemed so stiltified, whatever that means, up on stilts, you know, exonerated, uh, higher, exalted, you got to do it this way, and yeah, out of uh, almost uh, too 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 good too, for you, out of your reach, out yeah, of your understanding. Yeah. I felt that way too. It was very inaccessible in the beginning, yeah. and it was actually, you know, it was going back to Walter Paul or, or speaking to you. I mean, it was really people like you. When I when I sat down at the at the banquet table and you were at the same table, or I was looking for a table and you, I had spoken with you earlier at the GSBF event, you, mm -hmm. you, you said, pull up a chair. You know, it was like, uh, those moments were really pivotal for me because bonsai was becoming accessible from, I guess, the few people that 
weren't so hyped on maintaining this perception of what this formality was mm -hmm. supposed to be and behavior. Well, that you had to pay all your dues for years. Reverence <laughs> to, you know, and that's, and it's really interesting for me to talk with you about this because then I went to Japan and a, apprenticed myself to a master and that's the uh, ultimate and, and degree. That's what you do. Yeah. That's the ultimate degree of commitment, you know, but I almost feel like in coming back from Japan, having spent time with Mr. Kimura, who himself was, I think, very rejecting of the formality in the beginning, mm -hmm. beginning of his career. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I th it's interesting. I mean, his first book on all that trunk shortening and all that kind of exciting stuff. Yeah. That just, wow. Carving, guys, splitting, yeah. bending, yeah. yeah, really dissecting trees physiologically yeah. and, and, they, and, and surviving, you know, I mean, truly sculpting. Well, yeah, the shaving down of the sapwood down to the minimum so we can bend this thing and have the bark on it and yeah. shorten those trunks. It was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Great stuff. But, but you were right there. See, this is the thing, though, is you were right there with him. I mean, 84 Anaheim. Well, I, I and you're, know. You're out I, there with a chainsaw. I, <laughs> that, that got yeah. you kicked out of California. I know it. It was, it was what I kind of did, you know, just yeah. because I was driven with the dream of something that I'd seen in nature. I see these trees that are just, there's nothing left to them except just the outer bark and the, a little bit of cadmium, a little bit of sapwood, mm -hmm. and it's all doing well. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of deliberately imposing that kind of value on a bigger tree and, and um, Realizing that's a lot of um, excision of wood. How can I do it expeditiously? That little Toro chainsaw just really ate that stuff up and mm -hmm. putting a handle on the end. I remember seeing in one of the books a picture of Kimura uh, carving with a chainsaw, but he had a whole bunch of brackets around the engine up here holding it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I rigged up one of my handles and I sent it to him via someone who was going to visit in Japan. And, uh -huh. and I never heard anything from him, but I thought, <laughs> you know, this might give him the idea, just put it on the tip, it gives you all this control. Right. You can do anything you want. Right. It changes everything. And the first handle that I, uh, that I developed, I still got it in here. And it was cut off a table leg at Melba Tucker's house huh. before that thing at Anaheim. And I had been working with the saw a little bit, but not being able to control it very good on hard wood. And, and uh, her husband said, well, let's rig up a handle. We hear the hole in the bar out here. And, and we cut this thing off and <laughs> affixed it to the chainsaw. Yeah, affixed it to the chainsaw. And boy, it gave me all that. <laughs> what, what was it like? I mean, we were talking about the Fresno crew and talking about Ray Themey and Harold Latimer and John Roll and John Pittenger and, and John Pittenger and and you yeah, you know you them. you asked me how I knew them I yeah, I knew yeah. them because in college uh, at at the same Sacramento convention that I met you at uh, I was sleeping in the back of my truck and a guy from Visalia Anthony Galanti uh, had an extra bed and said mm -hmm. if you want to take a shower and sleep in a bed instead of your truck, you're welcome to yeah. share my room. So, you know, that, that was the beginning of going to Visalia. And then I kind of started meeting those guys in the Fresno GSBF convention where yeah. Shinji Suzuki was and Harry Harau styled the big California juniper. Yeah, that's that's in front of yeah. Collection North. Like that was kind of the beginning of meeting John Roll and, and Howard and some of those guys. But, you know, I was really coming along as as sort of another generation that was trying to understand what are you guys about what are the, what are you about how you know like john knock is talking about this stuff and i see this happening from japan you know and mr kimura is doing this but yeah, i don't see all of that uh, varied uh, information feeding in and you try you try to make sense of it i tried to make sense of yeah. it see but there was more input for me to try and like process through what what is this bone sign when i hear you say I knew that there was this Japanese art form where these guys were putting these trees in containers and you're up in the mountains, but you didn't have all of the clutter of everybody having tried to make well, sense of this right. foreign thing. Yeah. So you just kind of took it and said, oh, I make I trees just, that look oh, like trees. Okay, here they are. That's very, so, that's very hard for me to be able to digest because you really did 
you know, your style is your interpretation almost pure and, I would say, unobscured. But then it became something that was so controversial that you really had to put your flag in the ground and yeah. say, but this is how I do it because I'm not trying to do the same thing you're doing. And you said that earlier than anybody yeah. else did from my perspective. Yeah, I was, I was, I was reasonably straightforward about the way I felt about what I was doing things. And, uh, and, and the, the deal down in Fresno, I had, um, there was a bonsai convention in Pasadena in the early 70s, maybe 1970, I can't remember those things, but um, I went down to that and just as a voyeur, I don't know that I got in any of the programs. They had a, they were at a hotel and there was a great s a swimming pool and I had my daughter with me. So I'm my wife and daughter and of course they're out in the swimming pool and I'm trying to kind of get into the spirit of this first bonsai convention <laughs> ever. And I probably met maybe John Pittenger or one of the guys from Fresno. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him enough that I had been doing quite a bit of carving on some trees and stuff. And so they were kind of curious about that. And of course, nobody was doing that. And Kimura hadn't started doing it or there were any of that stuff. And so um, they invited me to come down to Fresno or at least to stop in there sometime when I'm going to LA for something. And so in the real early 70s, I, I met up with these four guys, all of whom were reasonably established bonsai practitioners. Right. And my big dream at the time was that I had this um, big stump type thing that was still alive and I wanted to hollow the whole thing out and and create an and to solve the absence of taper was to create internal taper mm -hmm. so that the trunk would taper up this way and and this way and I, I was convinced that it would give you the same impact but you had this other thing and I had to use a chainsaw to hollow it out because it was just this giant piece of wood sure and um, and they were all kind of enthused over this this idea of, of using some power tools to carve because no one had you know probably people messing around with a Dremel but I didn't even have a die grinder then right I went from the Dremel to the chainsaw just because it was so expeditious yeah and um, and like I said I had this I hadn't rigged that handle on it yet but it was just a little. Um, Toro chainsaw, electric one, $55 or something like that for this little inline, so it didn't have a side mount motor, and it was just kind of this little thing, and you could just, mm. really worked good. It jumped around, but it kind of led the way to creativity with its own irrational uh, breaches of my control. Yeah. So it, oh, ah, that looks pretty good, look at that, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, I was victimized by the power of it all, but it just was expeditious and that, boy, that was great. And so after that, I, I think those guys even suggested maybe trying something like a die grinder because uh, somebody there was using a, a router mm -hmm. to do some carving, you know. <laughs> Well, you're holding on to this machine. Here's this table. I can't, uh, and can't even imagine that. In here, you know, and, but it's throwing wood. Yeah. Which the Dremel didn't, didn't never throws wood. Sure. It just burns because the bit gets dull in five minutes. And right. So you're just SOL. So I think that was John Pittenger. Now, John Pittenger was a carpenter, a house builder. He ultimately moved to Texas, and I ran into him many years later down there at a pro. I took Walter Paul's place when he had that heart attack. Yeah. So I went on his Texas tour and I ran into John Pittenger down in there, which was 30 years after running into him in Fresno. And he still wasn't doing much with bonsai, but he still had the passion for it. I yeah. mean, there's so many people like that. They have one tree, you know, and they just love the whole thing and love watching you do this stuff. Well, how are you doing? Well, I, I'm doing okay. I mean, I haven't progressed any, but I'm happy with it. You know. and, and, and and love to think about it, enjoy yeah. it, be a yeah. part of it. Love to watch other people 
practice the art and do what's going on. So the, the demonstration thing has always been a powerful influence in the whole agenda of, of getting people enthused. And uh, to me, the whole thing was, how can I make this thing be endlessly fun? Mm. And so getting rid of a lot of the problems. And so I've got some problems. I've got problems with copper wire because it's the enemy of bonsai. Stronger than aluminum, mm -hmm. but it's the enemy. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Nobody anneals it right. Uh. You should be able to take a number 10 wire that's properly annealed and go like this and should wrap around your finger. And it isn't. Mm -hmm. It springs. I'm sorry, you're SOL. Mm -hmm. You can't put it on tight enough. If you can't put it on tight enough, you can't make a gnarly branch. But aluminum you can. Hmm. So why beat yourself up? Just use aluminum. It's a temporary training aid, for God's sake. But how much have you heard over the years that the real pros, they want you to use copper wire. Mm -hmm. That's going to give you a better tree? Bullshit. Hmm. What gives you a better tree is a great design and the ability to achieve the goal. What's terrible is for someone to have a goal and can't do it because the tool fails. And so I, I understood that. So I went after tools that really delivered the product, whether it's a die grinder instead of a Dremel, whether it's a little electric chainsaw, put a handle on it, then you can make it do anything you want. And so, you know, so the copper wire is an enemy. The concave cutter is an enemy. It leaves a goddamn depressed pruning scale scar, mm -hmm. which means you get to wait a long time to produce the flawless trunk that it should lead to after an eternity of waiting. And then you'll have a flawless <laughs> trunk on your tree. And I thought, what a fabulous thing. <laughs> Except I like those other kind of trunks mm. that are replete with the essence of life in the wilderness, the adversity, overcoming all of that abuse and still hanging in there. Yeah, That's what excites me. So the concave cutter is the enemy. I'm excluding the award that somebody devised out of the concave cutter award. I'm not sure what that's all about, but anyhow, the concave cutter is the enemy because it leaves a depressed leaf scale, a, a pruning scar. I don't want any bullseyes. That's one of my principles. That's one of your principles. And so, and it cuts off potential gins, especially in the hands of a novice. You turn this young tree and pretty soon it's just a bare trunk with all these pruning scars. Right. Said, well, um, this could have been an interesting feature on here if you would have, if you would have. So that and, uh, and copper wire are my two nemesis, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yet they're I fundamental, I right? I feel, like you can, I feel like you can be victorious in not engaging with them. <laughs> Anyhow, it's, it's just kind of, there just are these things yeah, that we've all been saddled with, because and and the the rule that uh, I remember Ben Oki, what a guy, anyhow, saying that uh, gin is inappropriate uh, on deciduous trees. Uh, huh? I'm I'm I've just driven through the Tehachapi's and looked at the great oaks up there with, with the huge scars where limbs had fallen off and here's this hollow space in here with a great old horned owl sitting in there looking at me mm. and it's inappropriate to have dead wood on deciduous trees who is this guy and where does he come from yeah who, who dreamed up that one right right yeah and so there's just a whole bunch of, there's a whole litany of these things that impinge on people's ability to uh, maybe um dream of possibilities but also to achieve the dream that they have how can i make this tree really be fabulous well for me this is how you might do that mm -hmm. and you got to have the tools and if you really want to have really gnarly branches you got to double wire them well here's another one when you put the wire on if you're going to put a second wire run it side by side and then don't give me that. Why would you run side by side? How about splitting the gap so it doesn't break there? 
Hello, Earth. Why do we run them side by side? Because aesthetically it looks better. It's a goddamn temporary training aid. Who cares how it looks? Mm. You want to save the branch. You want to control the branch, make it do what you want it to do. And so, okay, just split the gap with the second wire. That gives you twice the coverage. You still got the strength. And any stronger, you just have more opportunity to deliver the gnarly branch, which is a feature of ancient trees, which is my dream. Right. So all of it kind of feeds into how I mess with this stuff. And, and I pass that on to uh, clients and new people. And I say, and it's just fun to do this stuff. And if you use aluminum wire, you can take it off and use it again. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than cutting it into little pieces and putting sure. it in a bag like John Knocker used to do. I used to watch him down at his house and he had these bags of copper wire clips. Because, of course, I, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about the concave cutter is it's a great wire cutter for in, in grown into the branch <laughs> wire sure. that you can't see anymore, so it gets buried because it, you lose its color. Whereas aluminum wire turns white, so you know it's on there. It's easy to take it off. Right, right. But again, it facilitates achieving what you may be trying to do. And that's what tools can do, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a cell phone or whether it's a car or a die grinder, it's all a tool. And I just, just kind of feel that way about stuff. Why did you build a land and gardens? Well, we were having um, lots of people coming out here. To your home? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, they had, wanted to see your I trees. trees everywhere. Uh-huh. And we had that bonsai convention in Seattle in 84. And there were, you know, 400 people came out here with buses. And I would built a walkway, you know, and, and it was great. It all worked. It just kind of, I felt hamstrung. Mm-hmm. Because I couldn't really, even though I've done some really neat landscaping here, I've got the... I brought all these rocks in. This was a no-bank waterfront. And so I built up this promontory so that you'd have a pea gravel beach with a pine out on a thing and all this kind of stuff. And, and I liked all that, but I, I just had uh, this um, unrequited uh, energy to get more and more trees. And I had a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd go to... Colorado and spend two weeks down there with Larry Jackal and come back with a pickup truck load of great ponderosa pines, a lot of them for landscaping. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm covering the whole spectrum of my enthusiasm from bonsai, which isn't a money maker, to landscape trees. And so wanting all of that and gnarly wood, that big juniper snag, yeah. that was on top of a pile of ponderosas. So I put that on the very top because it was more precious. <laughs> than the Ponderosas, because right. they'll take the abuse. Yeah. But that guy just, I watched him in the rear view mirror all the way home, <laughs> kind of <laughs> rocking back and forth, t taking a little bark off here and there, but nah, it didn't bother that Ponderosa. No, no, nothing too damaging. It didn't hurt, yeah. the, didn't hurt the snag. So I, I just um, uh, had this, uh, I'd retired. I tried to get the job at Weyerhaeuser you know, because they were just uh, warehouse everyone was going to build this garden as a gift to the state of Washington to celebrate the bicentennial. They developed this uh, idea of a bonsai garden and they were looking for a curator. And so I was one of the participants. And uh, even though I'm living here, they contacted me by phone. And of course, uh, we had this guy named Richard Piacentini who was a bonsai guy maybe out of New York City, a little kind of a guy that had been in charge of the selection process. Hmm. And I met with him, and um, he was a real timid kind of guy. I mean, you know, I, I came into that meeting as a potential leader of this bonsai extravaganza that was going to go on with a whole litany of ideas that what I was going to try to do for the Weyerhaeuser company, which was going to turn bonsai into a worldwide adventure. And here were trees from the Weyerhaeuser company, the tree growing company. And trees were from all over the world coming in here. And we were going to have 
of buses taking these trees out to the schools in the Seattle area, educating kids about the art of bonsai. And so I came in with this, <laughs> this huge agenda for this poor little guy from New York City to pick up on. And I'm sure he just kind of made a deposit and just kind of backed out on me <laughs> and went for you Dave DeGroat. Him, Dan. Dave DeGroat, who's this nice enough guy who played in an orchestra down in New Orleans someplace and probably grew some bonsai trees and, right. and figured he'd be uh, easier to deal with because he might be diplomatic and might not have a whole agenda mm. surrounding the potential for the warehouser company to grow. So I, and you know, in my heart of hearts, I said, and I had several uh, warehouser clients that I pruned for and did landscaping for, mm. and so they were all enthused, and um, I just got, I was out of there. So anyhow, I just kind of, well, um, um, okay, I guess, well, I'll build my own garden. I was close to retiring from the fire department. How many years do you serve in the fire I put in 20, 25 mm -hmm. for the city of Bremerton. One day off, two days off. But the day on, half of the day, I'm working on bonsai trees in there in this ideal situation without any distraction other than the horn would blow every once in a while and you'd go on a run. Right. But uh, trying to do things down at the garden when people are there, I'm much better kind of alone on certain things I'm in okay in front of an audience, you know, but I just got to, anyhow. So I just, um, we started looking for land and I knew about this thing because I'd been driving by it for years out there, this old garbage dump and, and uh, contacted the city and, and this was about 1990, maybe about, and I retired in 91 and so I probably didn't do anything at about till 91 in terms of contacting the city because I'd been refused prior to that for this warehouser thing. And, um, and so they said, well, as long as you um, have something to do with education and or gardening, you can lease the land. It's, um, you know, it's very nominal, you know, $300 a month or something. And mm. it's 1,500 feet of waterfront. Yeah. But they can't do anything with it because mm -hmm. it's a landfill. Right. And so it's disappearing and the tide is coming in around the world. And so inevitability is that um, that contorted Dawn Redwood is gonna be on the brink with exposed roots in the salt water right. after a while. And that's where it goes. So anyhow, so we just uh, bought into that. And I'm so glad hmm. because the whole thing about working for a company with a different agenda, I'm not sure that I'd be persuasive or whether I'd spend all my time dealing with a bunch of loggers who might buy into the deal. I mean, I have no idea. Yeah, or with a bunch uh, of bureaucrats yeah. that don't want to, yeah. don't want to potentially. I don't have to deal with anybody yeah. at the garden. And so my will is my way. And it's been quite wonderful. And I thought, boy, the trouble with dealing with, uh, with other people is, um, Someone is always going to ask you, well, why do you want to do that, Dan? And I don't have an answer. I mean, why do you want to bring that giant rock in there? Why do I want to bring, you know, all of that kind of, yeah. I mean, it, I've been dealing with clients forever. And so I know what that's all about right. as a landscape designer. Luckily now I, they hire me for what I do. And so right. they all want a gnarly piece of wood. And, <laughs> big rocks. Yeah, big rocks. Crazy trees. Gnarly trees. Yeah, and, sure. And yeah. it's fabulous. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I kind of passed that all, all on to William, my son, and so he's, you know, of the same ilk, and he went down last summer and got some great wood down here north of Aberdeen, down on the, on the Pacific coast here, but back in the woods. That's where that great stuff comes from, from old cedar trunks that are from they, when they logged, and then they yeah. come in and log again, and tear this stuff up and put it in piles. Sure. Try to burn it, it's too wet to burn. So it just, there it is, so. Interesting. And you feel like, so almost, you know, serendipity kind of prevailed for you because you, you potentially could have become the curator of the Pacific Rim collection at one point and that might have completely, maybe it wouldn't have changed your trajectory, maybe it would have 
been utterly uh, utterly frustrating. Maybe you would yeah. have been able to have an impact and have greatly expanded the exposure yeah. to bonsai. You'll never know, but you yeah. created a land in gardens. Which has done it on its own. Which has done its own. I mean, yeah. you really have created a destination. I mean, there were a lot of people there today, and I'm assuming that's pretty normal. Oh, yeah, and you see it on weekends and summertime, and we have tour boats come into Bremerton and come over with buses. Yeah. That's a new kind of a thing. It's it's always been kind of a mixed blessing. Um, you know, we raised the price from eight, eight to ten dollars, and no one's troubled over that. We were at eight dollars for years, you know. Yeah. And so it's not really. It's mostly the gift shop that makes great money. Mm -hmm. But you know, we'll get thirty, fifty, or sixty people a, a day through there, and it's a little. I don't enjoy it as much as being down there with just a couple people where I can actually work on stuff because I love to stop and talk to people. Yeah. And so you're just kind of unproductive. Right. You know, I mean, you're productive in a proselytory standpoint, but not from getting anything done. And yeah. God knows there's stuff to do uh, at every turn. So you have a lot to do. A, you have a lot to do. Yeah. It's like this bark thing. I mean, I spent, you know, a yard of bark isn't a lot of bark, but carrying it up in between those trees and pulling all the weeds out first and bending down and putting, getting them in the right place. By the end of the day, I'm weary. And I think, you know, it's, it's a 2,200 pounds for God's sake with a little bucket, but cumulatively, it just kind of makes me tired. But I always wake up the next morning uh, feeling great. <laughs> That's awesome. So it does kind of wearify me, but whereas pruning doesn't. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I spend, well, I'll, I'll put nine or 10 hour days of pruning on some of these extensive trees. And uh, it's, you know, you don't work up a sweat. You, you're cold if you don't do it the right time of year because you're not working hard enough. Right. You know, you're doing this. Well, okay, you're stretching and all that's good and got great stomach muscles from <laughs> sure. this kind of position. Yeah, but, awkward asymm yeah. Uh, yeah, asymmetric but, um, poses. Yeah, you don't get fatigued. And so. I, I kind of enjoy getting fatigued because I used to um, do all the landscaping and that was rock and gravel and trees and all that. So William mostly does that stuff and I let him just do the heavy stuff. I figure, why not? You know, I, I'm busy making it look good. Yeah. You know, and he can bring this stuff over in a wheelbarrow and doesn't seem to mind it. I mean, that guy is so strong. He's, you know, there's these, um, side rails on his big boom truck that are uh, five quarter plywood, you know, two feet wide and eight feet long with posts and, and it's up here, you know, and I, I grab that and climb up in, but he can take this and lift it out of the slots. <laughs> right. I, you know, and I stick a crowbar in here and pry up this one and put a block and pry this sure, one up. Sure, sure. <laughs> One of those kind of deals, but uh, the functional strength of yeah. youth. I taught your crew here how to lift today, so they'll never hurt their back. Oh, that's good. I told them make sure you look up when you come up. That's all you got to remember. Look up when you come up. Yeah. And that transfers it all to right here. Needs to do all the work, and they won't do much work because you probably haven't been doing squats. But once you do those, and then it relieves your back. So. Are you pruning off of some sort of concept or are you just in the moment making decisions that feel right? Well, I'm, I'm making the decisions, but there's a, a fundamental rule that anything, anything that's linear is the enemy. So straight is bad mm -hmm. because it's juvenile and nobody likes juvenile trees. Right. Even though we all get them, because that's what you get. Mm -hmm. The lace leaves are all these linear shoots, and so you prune it properly, you prune everything back to the first set of buds, and then it's going to fork. And then it grows again, and you prune it back, and it forks again, and after a while it becomes forking beautiful, and it's more better. So linear is the enemy. And if there's anything that I find that's, that's um, wrong about 
um, the big canopies on the pines and these big helmets is that they're full of linear branches in there completing the crown. Mm -hmm. I said, who cares about completing the crown? Get rid of the linear branch. Make it a gnarly branch that feeds the crown and it's more better. Yeah. And so, you know, I've relayed that to people all the time. You know, it's easy to prune the trees. Just get rid of the linear things. And well, how do you do that? Well, you prune it back to some place where it's going to dichotomize or change direction. And you do that over and over, and then you get branches that do this. And it's fabulous, mm -hmm. as opposed to this, yeah. which is what nature wants to do. It's called apical energy, and when the roots are close, there's a fusion of water. Interesting. So close roots are the enemy, and gnarly ones are the good guys, and ancient ones are better yet because it's such a long pipeline, the water can't get up, and so you get stasis. How much of your how much of your forestry background contributes to your bonsai approach? Would you say nothing? Nothing, except tree ID. Okay, because you had told me one time, not told me, the panel discussion at the Natives exhibition at Pacific Bonsai Museum. Okay. You, you you made a statement and you said, "Listen, in forestry, we define an ancient tree by a dead top." Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, as a, as a concept to back into the discussion of how do you describe ancient? Because I, I think everybody tries to make sense of what is ancient, you know, this nebulous know. term yeah. to reference a, some unknown what life. What is an ancient, yeah. A, a age of some uh, unknown yeah. entity, right? And we're saying ancient, but you said, you know, that's, the, that's sort of a, a quantifier of ancient. It's the beginning of, yeah. right? And I thought, oh, oh, okay, so forestry, you know, so I started looking into forestry descriptions and whatnot after that, and I really didn't see anything, and I thought, I wonder how much of that has contributed. And I thought, well, maybe Dan's forestry experience is what took you into these remote places and started to present you with these ideas of these, you know, random forms. No, the, um, that particular reference came from Dr. Brockman, who was the author of the dendrology books for forestry schools, who was the professor at the University of Washington when I was there. Oh, okay. And his definition of an old growth tree was a conspicuous absence of taper, a dead or flattened top, and thick bark. <laughs> and you think about that in relation to bonsai, and of course, the conspicuous absence of taper Hmm, how does that relate to uh, these um, uh, maples with these exaggerated yeah. Mount Fuji trunks right. and stuff? Yeah. And so, well, there's that. But um, that was all, and I just remembered that as his definition. And of course, he had written these books, which everybody poured over. They were kind of a, a dark reddish color dendrology book and full of uh, ID on all the methodology, the stomates and all this different stuff right. on each tree and its range and where you put it. And he had written the books. And he, uh, he loved me in the class because I was a, a tree form identifier. And so I knew him from a distance. I didn't have to count the stomates or or, you know, all this other stuff right. where the other forestry students were down there with their magnifying glasses and we'd go out around campus every day. I mean, our class was field observations and he'd pointed a tree down there and, uh, and we all had these little tablets and we'd write down what it is and why. And he'd point at these things and I'd just write it down and then just hand it to him. Mm. You know, and after a while he said, you know, Robinson, you're just like I was. I just knew what trees looked like yeah. and knew most of them from their form, the way their branch patterns are or anything else. And uh, so that was endearing. You know, I, I enjoyed that guy. And then he had made this pronouncement on old growth trees, which I wasn't particularly cued into, but I was aware of them because I grew up, uh, my grandfather's place, there was this giant fir 
way back in the woods that just towered up and they'd logged everything off in the 1850s and here was this monster back there and had a dead snag top on it that kind of meandered around and <laughs> and um, so I, I've just had that kind of background in this thing that um, fed my enthusiasm for for tree ID and of course as a freshman in college I had collected the, the, the seeds off of um, a Port Orford cedar, one of those cones. And I was living with my grandmother on, over in, this in is, the university. This and, is this. And I, yeah. And it, she put them above the sink and three little trees came up in there and, and I ultimately took them down to my grandfather's place in Grapeview and hmm. planted them in the ground and they kind of grew and stepped on it. And, and <laughs> it wasn't a bonsai, uh, you know, for stepped on. forever. It grew, we well, stepped you, on it. You saw the uh, the bonsai that was my first one when yeah. I bought that from a nursery as a reasonably mature mugo pine, which is about the same time as I was growing this from seed, but uh -huh. it took a long time from seed to <laughs> amount to anything. <laughs> the but, mugo's uh, impressive, though. It's impressive. <laughs> well. It's old. What's amazing is to have all of these trees that I started with 65 years ago yeah. in the garden, which there's probably 25 or 30 of them that I've had for 60 years. And that's unfathomable actually. And well, I know cause everybody loses them, but everybody does the bad thing. They all are into the concept of root pruning. <laughs> Hello. And it kills trees. Do you want to kill a tree? It's Cut tough, the roots it's, off. It's tough to it's tough to argue with when you have you know a lot of trees that are sixty plus years. And let me just say this: your concept of stasis, because that's a tough thing to keep a tree from thriving. You know, I mean, I that's a, that's a that there's a, a security blanket with a tree growing vigorously I that you so. feel like you're doing the right thing. I remember hearing someplace that the Japanese um, support the whole uh, root pruning thing because they prefer to have the trees on the juvenile side of life rather than something else. And the juvenile side means short roots. So you get the water up there, mm -hmm. which means root pruning. Mm -hmm. Concurrent with that though is how do you really root prune trees? And 99% of the people in the US take it out of the pot and cut an inch off of the outside where all the white root tips are, plunk it back in real fast because they don't want to expose those roots, right? You know, it's a danger thing. And they cut off all the live roots. Mm. And then they hope it's going to work. And I, you have no idea how many good bonsai people I've talked to and I've asked them, hey, how is that tree doing? They said, you know, I repotted it and it died. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, and I've had the same thing till about 35 years ago. Yeah. And then I said, why am I doing this? Considering my experience with ancient trees growing in a tight pocket where there's no more room in that pocket for root growth. And the truth of that is that the trunk is expanded because there was no more room. And so you've got this bulbous base. Yeah. Where all the product that would have gone to root growth can't get down there. Sure. And it's still doing. It isn't doing well, but it's achieved stasis. Mm -hmm. And you were, so you're willing to relinquish control of the canopy's fate as well, though. Yeah. You want you you're not you're not interested in the tree dying, but you're dropping maybe pieces, losing a branch. Losing a branch. To you me, don't have. Like I said, it's that opportunity. Right. Right. You know, okay. Could you say 35 years ago you stopped repotting, but that 35 years ago the focus in bonsai or the understanding of technique may not have been what it is today? Would you say? No. You think technique was as high 35 years ago in the execution of the craft of bonsai as it is today? Well, of course, individuals make up this selective group of people that turn out great trees. Yes, yes. And everybody's got different levels of competency in that whole arena. I'm not sure how that question relates necessarily to root pruning. 
but um, I know that for myself, what I found is that if I can keep the tree in balance with assiduous pruning, then it doesn't lift itself out of the pot. What is assiduous pruning? Hard pruning. Hard pruning. Yeah. So you're cutting back big, strong pieces. You're hold, well, not holding giant things, but uh, the every vigorous year, tips, right? Every year, produce needles like this, and the amount of root development from tiny little needles is tiny. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't run into it with hinokis because they produce little tiny things. But on all the pines, little growth, and then you prune it, shorten it. I just went through this guy and cut back each fan, taking the center out. Mm -hmm. So that it's just a little explosion here. Yeah. It just stands still in that pot. This makes sense to me though. You 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 have you have cracked you have cracked the code for me on 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 stasis because and I think there's really something important about this. I think that I think that you are you are t tapping into something that has not been understood and I've really wanted to understand this process because obviously coming back from Japan when I'm looking at the approach of Dan Robinson I'm saying that's crazy. Yeah. You know, but I but this is what we do. What, I mean, we've done it for 600 years. Yeah, yeah, or, maybe. I yeah, just didn't yeah. have another reference, you well, know. Okay, yeah. Because I was trying to figure all this so out. So what does Kamura do? What? Does he repot every two years, five years? No, three? no, but but we'll okay. talk about that. Okay. He, he, Mr. Kamura is a beautiful middle ground mm. that that yeah. all that all kind of that all explain. But coming back, you know. You were you were flying in the face of John Naka's teachings. Oh, I you know. know. I mean, you I, you were, and you talked well, about. Well, this is why I was excluded from California. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he and I were friends, but I wasn't invited. Right. <laughs> but but he yeah, these were his acolytes. Yeah. Prote you know, do, protecting oh, his sure. gospel, which is he fun. Was, he was fabulous for. I mean, look at the National Collection. Yeah. He was the figurehead for the whole shittery. You sure. Know, and, Fabulous. And you're well, uh, and you're brought in the money and there everything. Too. I'm just a guy out in the country, got a bunch of trees that I've been messing with, and they're all still alive. But you, but you know, so trying to figure this out, and like it was really confusing. And I remember sitting at the table of the convention, and you were talking with me about what you're talking with me about largely now, which you have maintained a very consistent approach to your bonsai and yeah. I remember Cheryl Manning was sitting there and Ann Herb was sitting there and, mm -hmm. a, and a multitude of other people were sitting there yeah. and they were really they were really challenged by what you were saying and you oh, were yeah. challenged by what they were trying to accomplish yeah. and it was an interesting thing to observe and I spoke with Ted Madsen after that and he said listen like Dan Robinson's style or not if you want to talk about somebody who's an artist Dan Robinson's an artist he's he's not doing it this way because he's following the rules he's doing it this way because that represents what he sees a tree to be and that really yeah. stuck with me yeah, and I started a... I started thinking about that very hard you know and then when mm -hmm. when when we were on in the panel discussion for the natives exhibition and and you kind of came in a little bit later oh is the beer can not attractive oh okay. <laughs> oh I got you well Better. oh Better. <laughs> okay <laughs> It, but but when you know you came in a little bit later and you kind of said I've always been on the outskirts of town. Yeah. Right. I've always the kind of safe way to do this kind of stuff. I've always been outside <laughs> of the norm or outside of the accepted trend. Yeah. But you just cracked it for me because f I, I've had this curiosity the entire time. It was it, it really is at the root of coming and spending time with you and your trees is understanding this intention that you have that is not normal to the bonsai pursuit that has bred a methodology that is undeniably compelling. And you can mm -hmm. see that because people are showing up from all over the world to see your work at a land and gardens yeah. and understanding why did you do this and how did this come about? And it seems to me it, it does continue to come back to uh, because it is, it is just the greatest representation of your interpretation mm -hmm. and experience, yes. experiences. I can't, I can't see any other, Think you're not thinking about 
cultural or political connotation or context. You're, no, that, that's actually no. tainting the whole thing, and you're not yeah. thinking about convention or tradition. That actually yeah. is exactly opposite of what yeah. you're wanting to do. It's very fascinating, Dan. Well, that's, it's, um, you put it quite wonderfully with an articulateness that exceeds my own. I, you know, I don't spend any time necessarily thinking about it, but this is just kind of what roils through my brain as I look at a tree and something like that. I just, well, this is what you could do in there and it would really be nifty. When I look at your carving, I see the Pacific Northwest, but I want to ask you, is there a landscape that inspires you more than another as far as, you know, the, the, the natural environment being out in it and taking that influence into your bone type practice? Or like, are there images that echo in your mind more strongly than others? Yeah, I think probably, <laughs> I know it's strange, but uh, I love to um, drive and look at dead tops on trees. Mm -hmm. You pointed them out as we were on our way here. <laughs> I know we saw, we, we, yeah, we, we three got them. Four ancient cedars, and they're not particularly dramatic compared to what I've seen, but right. the old candelabra type cedar thing that you saw on the coastal cedars, that giant stump that's in my landscape down right. there yeah. with the stalactites in front of it. Yep. And, uh, and that would have been one of those uh, cathedral type tops multiple dead tops, all of them progressively dying down as the roots get longer mm -hmm. <laughs> to the low branches, which then would be the last ones alive. Yeah. And um, I know when I go up in Vancouver Island driving through areas where there's old growth, my eyes are just out there, um, you know, not looking at points, but looking at the dead tops and seeing how that naturally has occurred and what a story it tells mm -hmm. and why that's such a fascination for me. But you see my smaller pieces of dead wood all around that are yeah. gnarly, which I always tell people, you got to collect these and have them on your workbench when you're carving. So you know what to make it look like. Right. Because you can't pull it out of here without having seen that. Again, that's the connection with your eyes and your brain, the memory banks of interesting things to reduplicate, mm -hmm. to impose. Mm -hmm. Like I said, when a branch dies on a tree, it's, oh, it's opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As long as it's still alive. Of course, if it breaks in the middle of the trunk and it's down, well, it's a neat snag. Save that. <laughs> Would you consider yourself somebody who doesn't seek to have control? Or would you consider yourself somebody that feeds, that, that thrives on having some control? Ooh, boy, modicums of control. Well, I certainly am controlled when it comes to the care of them. Mm -hmm. The dedication to every other day watering. I mean, it's all about the water. Mm -hmm. That's what, if you're trying to grow bonsai, you gotta learn how to water. Now, it's interesting that it takes two or three years to learn how to water in Japan. I can teach somebody in about half an hour, you know. But that's having the right kind of soil and all these ingredients in the mix so that it's going to work. I, don't, I, yeah. don't, I have no idea what they could teach somebody over several years how to water, but maybe each tree has a different formula in there. And so it doesn't take quite as much to me. I just flood it enough until it comes out the bottom of the pot and okay. Mm -hmm. then, the, then I'm going to have air spaces and they're going to have humidity and, and we're, you know, but, um, the control of other things, I don't, I'm, I'm fairly laissez-faire about letting people come in and prune on things. So the bad pruning that was done, I can get rid of that and everything's going to be fine because enough of it's there and there's plenty of tree and it's all about the trunk. Mm -hmm. So this peripheral stuff is quite often the enemy. All this little stuff is in the way. Yeah. It's like that snag that I stand up, that juniper snag right on the rock when you walk out. Right, the when park. you walk out, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it's all about, the structure and the branch pattern, not the foliage or its abundance. And abundance is the enemy. Mm -hmm. If it's hiding the real value, which is all of this kind of stuff. So I have uh, people come in and help me, and I'll turn them loose on and pines and 
Then I'll come back and, oh, well, you shouldn't have taken that off, but it's okay. I, it's going to grow. I'm, there's another thing here. So, you know, it's just that I'm I marvel. So, I, I, mar I marvel at your willingness <laughs> I, I'm just to so, accept uh, that. <laughs> I, I've got such abundance yeah. Yeah. that it's easy yeah. to be generous. I mean, if you had one goddamn a tree, well, that's another thing uh, but you have such a vision that's what doesn't make sense to me is you have such a, a a vision of what you're I mean did you have a clear vision of a land and gardens or did that also obviously a garden no. evolves but it like did all you, spontaneous spontaneous complete improvisation yeah, and whole, you feel bonsai is that the mother of creativity is spontaneity mm -hmm. that's that rules me more than anything and so the plan is the enemy. If you're building a house, you're dealing with dimensional lumber, okay, I guess you gotta have a plan. Yeah, right. But it's like my entryway in there. Yeah. I just kind of decided right in the midst of things, shit, I'm gonna put some big rocks in here and make this bigger and just do things that way. And um, it's always exciting. Yeah. And, and so, Allowing people to work on some great tree with a kind of a, well, you know, you take it back to the first set of needles. And <laughs> yeah. I get a whole gang of people in here on uh, the end of June from Puget Sound, and I turn them loose on the pines and say, come on, let's get all these decandled or whatever you want to call it. Sure. Because at that point it is a candle. Yeah. You know, and... Um, that always works, and then there's always some things that, well, I don't know, probably wouldn't take that off, but it'll grow. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got stuff in the ground. I've got stuff everywhere to do. Yeah. And I realize my limitation in terms of being able to um, get done with all of it because it all grows too much here. Mm -hmm. And so I just enjoy having the help. Yeah. Even though it may be, uh, I've got this gal, Nikki, who who lives in William's big building up there by where that big juniper is. Not juniper, but uh, azalea, okay. that big building. Sure. She's, she's a homeless gal and she lives there and so she kind of guards things and she works with me on stuff and she's just a fanatic about picking every little tiny weed. And I said, just just put bark over it, you know. <laughs> we'll spray it with Roundup and yeah. we'll take care of it. But she, no, <laughs> Wants it to be so, just so. I, I enjoy her, her her assiduousness, her dedication, but it's just kind of unproductive. Come on, let's get done with this thing. Yeah. I'm out of here. So, um, but I I just uh, enjoy all of it. Yeah, and it and it's to me. I see about uh, six years, five years ago, I had this heart attack. And I was on my way to a pruning job and I stopped in down there at the garden and I ran into the store to get my rain gear and I was coming out to my truck and I got dizzy and I leaned up against one of William's big rocks and I fainted. And then I woke up after a while, I have no idea. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna be late. So I went out in the truck and then drove over to Tacoma and going across the Narrows Bridge, I started to perspire. And I thought, well, this must be something more than what it appears. Dehydration. So or, I yeah. called everybody and went back to the hospital and drove in and don't remember anything else for two days. And then they sent me home the day after that and Holy shit. said, well, you had a, a dam, a calcium dam on one of your coronary arteries. You don't have any heart disease. You don't have any plaque, but you've got calcium somehow built up on that coronary artery in there. And dammed it off so we had to open you up and drill it away and and then we macerated the artery a little bit so it was bleeding out and so we took an artery out of your leg and plugged it in and you can go home now and so well okay so so I've been then I was in the hands of the doctors and so they decided well let's put a stint in your dorsal aorta that's the one coming out of the top of the heart if it was bigger and more generous, maybe you'd be more productive. So I said, okay. So they put one of those in there. And then after a while they said, well, we're detecting a little bit of fibrillation on your heart here. So 
it's giving you an alblasia treatment, which is a cauterizing of the electrics around your heart and to not let it fibrillate. So, okay, you know, so, you know, as an enthusiast for medical stuff, I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I get another shot? Yeah, give me one, right? I want to live. Mm -hmm. So I went through all this stuff and then uh, about three months ago, I went in and they said, well, you're, we can't do anything else for you. Just do whatever you want. You can run or do so. We fixed you. Yeah, we fixed you. We you're, did everything we could. You're good as new. <laughs> you're good as new. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just, you know, we got rid of the dam. So, it, and that just kind of set me into a thing where, okay, you don't go on forever. Yeah. And I always thought that I was going to, I remember years ago thinking that I'm, I'm good for about 150 years. Of, that's going to give me, at that time, it was going to give me 120 years of bonsai care on these trees. Mm -hmm. And they were going to be fabulous after that much time. Yeah. And uh, so lately I've been thinking, well, maybe, maybe 70 years, because I've been <laughs> yeah, 65 yeah. now on some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll. You've got a few more decades. I could go. In you. I could go. You got a few Either more decades way, in you. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Anyhow, it hadn't really altered anything. I'm still a, as zealous as ever, but I don't do as many push ups, and it's hard for me to do a chin up. And when I was a fireman, I did 18 of them. <laughs> and so I'm, but I can prune all day long and yeah. not get tired, and I can do my normal stuff. and. I don't have the cardiovascular exercise I should have, but I'm able to perform all day long, and so really it's good enough. So I'm not driven to achieve that kind of excellence that might be a harbinger of a much longer life, yeah. whether it's argumentative at this age. I mean, I just learned the other day that I don't have to take baby aspirin anymore oh. because they decided that baby aspirin over your, if you're over 65, you don't need to take it. So huh? the medical world keeps evolving. They learn more <laughs> every going, day, don't yeah. they? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's see. So pretty soon they're gonna bring back margarine. Okay, yeah, back right. to the margarine. Yeah, right. the, Country crop. There was a little deal in there that you would break to mix in with the margarine to make it look like butter. I mean, this was back in 53. Oh God, when that's hardcore. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. <laughs> processed foods. Yeah. That's when processed foods started changing the way things work. You, now, would you say that bonsai has kept you young or bonsai landscaping, I your, think, your chosen, yeah, yeah. Your chosen uh, lifestyle has I kept you? I honestly think that one of the, the things that has led to my really good health, except for this incident, is the proximity to pure oxygen. Because mm -hmm. I'm quite often, I'm right here. And I live here. Yeah. No, this, so is, this is tough. It doesn't to get any better right than this here. because in between us and 5,000 miles of ocean till you get to China with whatever they're putting in the air, there's nothing in the way. There used to be the mills down in Aberdeen that would, I mean, I've got lichen growing here. See that stuff hanging from the tree? That's yeah. called the old man's beard. And it's very sensitive to, uh, to pollution. Mm -hmm. And this, you find this down on the coast, and it can get to be 30 inches long. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's hanging from the trees here, and so we're blessed with that. But also, I'm really close to these guys, and it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Because I always think about the poor guy living in the basement in New York City. And the closest tree is in Central Park, and it's 10 miles away. Yeah. <laughs> and how many other people have you? And so one of the... Well, the startling thing in a way with modern TV is how it's endlessly full of ads for your health. Yeah. I remember early on, there, there wasn't anything about your health on TV, you know. There was maybe something to clean your nose out if you had a cold, you know. Sure. Priving. Take right. priving, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Relieve your runny nose. But now there's all these cures for what ails you. And so apparently the country is full of ailments. And um, of course, the COVID thing is that whole thing. So, but um, I just feel great and, and uh, do what I do and eat lots of fruit and lots of 
dates and figs and nuts and bananas and grapes. Yeah. Although still I like just those take grapes, little huh? I just take little pieces of grapes now and it's kind of a dinky little tree, so you not, don't you don't go for the not for the full the OGs. The whole swag. I mean I remember the Thompson seedless grapes when they came in. I mean life for me has been things that I used to love and enjoy and they're no longer available. Has that that's gotta be does that make you sad? Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I remember uh, Fairchild tangerines. When I was a kid, they filled my stocking with them at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And they were full of seeds, but God, they tasted good. I used to get tangerines in my stocking. And you stocking can't too. even get them That's anymore. Great. Now you've got these satsumas that don't have half the flavor and there's no seeds in there. If there aren't any seeds, where's the nutrition? Yeah. I mean, look at the grapes. They're all seedless grapes. Yeah. And I used to love the Concord, not the Concord, but the Emperor grapes that would come before Christmas, uh, probably the first end of middle of November, and they'd run through all the way through February. And these big grapes, five or six seeds in there. I remember as a kid picking them out. Then after a while, I just started crunching them up. Yeah. And grape seed is, a, a, you know, a great nutritional thing. Right. And now the only grapes we have don't have any seeds anymore. Sure. Sure, that's so modern man has done great things and nutritionally for us. <laughs> Endless variety, but just flavor. No nutrition in there. So anyhow, do you, but I get lots of nutrition. I mean, we're all loaded with it compared to what we had historically. Well, that's what I was going to say. We just had potatoes to eat. But I was going to say, do you think things are getting better or things are getting worse? Nutritionally? Eh, just, just things, you know? I mean, well, in general, think, the whole kit and caboodle think, of... I think everything, uh, you know, it's really desperate. I don't, shouldn't get into it, but I just think it's uh, terrible what's going on. Mm -hmm. The environmental thing is just yeah. a, a huge human tragedy. And going back to, you, you've been talking about thriving more, potentially doing better as an individual kind yeah. of on your own. Well, and getting people involved in it. Right. I and mean, this has been... What I love is to deal with people and get them enthused about this art where they can grow their own oxygen. Right. <laughs> at, right. At least. Yeah. But do you do you view your relationship with the tree as a collaboration? Like how how does where does the tree when you are when you are making these decisions and you're engaging with the tree in this fashion, you know, where does the tree where do you connect with the tree or how does that work for you? In the in the general broad scheme and theme of, I don't um, I don't consider it. I just think about how I can impose. Sounds really self-centered, but that's the business. How I can impose on this tree a a different character than it is manifesting now. Mm. And coincident with that, make it look more interesting for humans who might gaze upon it. I don't think the tree. I don't think the tree really knows the difference, as long as it gets the proper nurturing. Mm -hmm. And the proper nurturing, from my standpoint, is a life of uh, semi-desperation, because the ones that live the longest are the ones that have been abused the most. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting. what makes it fallacious, I think, to follow a Japanese notion that we want these trees to be on the juvenile side because it guarantees long life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of battle with that because the logic is there. All right, useful energy. It's healthy, right. it's big, it's strong, and then you go out and fight, run, and then yeah. you die of a heart attack. Right. And so, and then I think about those bristle cones or the pr trees on the precipice or the ancient redwoods and, yeah. and the struggle to stay oh, oh, up in the air or get the water and they hang in there. And so when I'm imposing my value on the tree, it's, it's superficial mm -hmm. compared to the lifeline if I do it right, mm -hmm. you know, keep the water flowing. You can take the whole inside out and enjoy that hmm. concavity and 
that look and the tree doesn't know you were there. And so that's kind of an art or a technique, you know, good technique is going to deliver that. Kimura did that with the, the reducing the lifeline down to that skinny little thing so, so he could fold it up and shorten yeah. the trunk. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 Masterful stuff. Yeah. And what was always interesting to me, and the only reference I have to it, is how much, how many years of sapwood do you have to leave on a tree to get the water flow sufficient? Well, the only thing I can say is that there's one tree that we know of that gets along with three years worth of sapwood and all the rest reverts to heartwood and it's the, the laburnum. Hmm. So I tell people, well, all you got to do is leave three years because <laughs> it works for the laburnum. There you go. But the problem is how much sapwood is there that you can remove? How many years? When does it stop flowing and get clogged up and yeah. still look like sapwood? I mean, you, you cut through a maple tree, you can't tell where heartwood is or sapwood or anything else. Well, where, how much... You know, like when I'm going to carve on that beach down there to, yeah. to protect that smooth bark, you know. Mm -hmm. How much sapwood do I have to leave under there to, well, anyhow, I don't think anybody knows. I don't think, I don't think that there is a, uh, no. I don't think there is a physiological determination on that. I mean, I think this is like the great mystery of bonsai and where bonsai potentially has the power to contribute greatly to our understanding of trees. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we more intimately handle trees in this yeah. in this uh, endeavor than any other any other oh yeah aspect of horticulture, botany, or yeah. or, or or dendrology. To, years, to the best of my knowledge, hundreds of years of <laughs> of this tutelage and handling the intimate internal structure of the tree. Yeah, that's a that's a bonsai yeah. a, a, an aspect of bonsai that is unique. Yeah. I've got a, a great thing to show you down there. It's a Lasky yellow cedar that um, I collected out of a kind of a, a flowing little stream kind of a thing. And it was uh, rooted way down below the stream because it's a bog and bogs accrete and gradually bury the trunk. And so the part that was down under was fine because it was in the water sure. all the time. And Preserved, so it didn't decay. Yeah. And then Here's this part that was up floating on the water and all of the, uh, the woody part was gone mm -hmm. down to just these ribbons of bark with Interesting. the right amount of sapwood and right. cambium and foliage. And so I put it in the pot and it just drapes down over the, the pot. And all, the uh, trunk? The, 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 the whole thing the, kind of folded the, over? Well, the whole trunk is just kind of gone because I cut that bottom part off because mm -hmm. it was down way down under and so I gotcha. brought this part where there were roots and, and now that tr trunk has just dilapidated uh -huh. what was left and I honestly think that when uh, uh, you know the, the whole idea of log storage underwater is fine in fresh water because there's just aren't the bugs to eat it and it'll last forever but I think if you pull that log out and put it on the dry land that it dilapidates very quickly with the wet and dry. Right. If you cut it into lumber and use it inside the house, well, okay, it isn't wet and dry anymore. Because yeah. I, I collected a log out of Mission Lake, which is just past where you're staying up there, and a guy had, the roots were on the, so the tree had fallen into the lake however long ago it was. The roots were up in the air because they were kind of dry and he pulled this thing out and called me and said, I've just pulled this log out of the lake and it's a really neat looking old thing. You want that for your garden? Oh no, yeah, great. Picked it up, but used it in the landscape and it's totally gone. Hmm. Except the roots. Uh. So the roots never were submer submerged in the lake. The log was. Mm -hmm. And so it was redesigned. However, that could, whatever that means. Yeah. And then I pulled it out and put it on the ground and then it was wet and dry, wet and dry, and it is just gone. Yeah. Where you were looking at that little um, spruce, mm -hmm. there was a log once behind it. Is this, is this big round of old growth cedar? Uh-huh. And in 30 years, 
it is just flat out gone. There's just kind of a bump in the bank because Kinnikinnick is kind of growing. And yet here's these roots down here at this end. Interesting. And so this thing was floating in the water. So it was even the upper part was kind of wet and dry, wet and dry. And so it completely rotted away, leaving just the, the ribbons of structure. The trunk had it come out of the ground. The part down here was constantly wet, so it's it was okay, but I, I cut it off. But I've got a chunk of that. And then this, but this part here, just all gone. Mm -hmm. so, and, and it's in my book. Mm -hmm. as this kind of neat looking thing with this trunk. Sure. And it's just gone. <laughs> Interesting. After, you know, 20, 25 years or something. So, uh, you know, ain't nature grand. You know, yeah. figuring out how what a, what a mystery. All these things go on, and yet the tree survives fine with just this ribbon. And so, in a way, the whole idea of taking a tree that's round and cutting through it and unfolding it should work. Technically. <laughs> Technically. As long as you've got the water and the bark and you've the got stuff enough. And you just, you've got enough of the water, yeah. right? Which yeah. nobody knows how much that is. Well, that's right. And um, so there's just a whole myriad of things that are kind of fascinating to mull over and conjure on. And, and uh, but the day to day thing of just uh, watching things evolve under your tutelage is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I've watched that for 60 years with these, all the pines that I grew from the seed that I collected in the mountains of Korea yeah. way back. And now I've got some with trunks this big and uh, some landscape ones that are this big. And and it's just- That's gotta be so rewarding. I was trying a, to think about that. It's just a thrill. I was thinking I about mean, that today as we were looking at those landscape pieces and the trees that, you know, the ones that were growing in the ground by the hemlock waterfall where you're saying, yeah, these are about 10 years. I thought about taking them out. And here's the ones I took out two years ago and they were on the bench yeah. where you're going to build the pond. Yeah. And I was just thinking, God, what a, you know, I get, I get a lot of pleasure out of, I, I, I've been building my garden for 12 years. I get so much yeah. pleasure out of 12 years. But when you say, you know, I've been working on some of these for 65 years, it's just like, man, <laughs> If I'm excited after 12 years, yeah. but I also think like, you know, I asked you before we started, do you still love bonsai? And you say, oh yeah, I love it now more than ever. Yeah. And, and, and I also, you know, would follow that up with asking like, you know, are there things that you still aspire to accomplish or do, or is it not about that anymore? Is it just about the act of continuing what you've been doing like what does that look like at this stage of your career because mm -hmm. you really obviously had a stage of your career where you were making statements through your work and you mm -hmm. were and you were and you were you were opening people's minds to another way to per, to, to yeah. potentially view the intention of this entire endeavor where are you at now yeah well I still um, cherish that opportunity. I loved going back there and talking to these guys about the trees around them and why they look like they look, mm -hmm. why they're all young trees. And you can tell because they all are still pointing up towards the sky. Right. I mean, as, as fundamental as that is, it's eye opening to people because they just, you don't ever hear any of this stuff anywhere. It doesn't exist in no. a book. It doesn't no, exist in they a book. Don't, you know, they, they don't teach anything in school anymore except computers. Right. And I don't know what's on the computers because I don't do computers. So I'm, you know, I've never seen your shows, what you're doing, which obviously is eminently successful. There's a lot of people that do do that. I just, I don't know. I'm just not, you know, I don't spend time doing that. I, I'm I, envious of your cell phone. Yeah. It's kind of. I crazy. am. I am super it, envious it of it. Sometimes, and I answer it, and then I'll make a call. Success to me is no longer having a cell phone. Well, it's it's a, such a fabulous tool, but it's the enemy because it makes you dumb. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at all these people that don't know their address and don't know a phone number, can't can't deal with a map. And I said, uh, huh? 
<laughs> What's the deal? Yeah. Um, and I mean, it works great as long as you still have electricity. Sure. But if we don't have electricity, I'm sorry. Yeah. But that 50% of the population is is out of here. <laughs> you know? I, yeah, I think that's being generous. A, a, sol a solar flare would change things for sure, <laughs> right? Yeah, boy. Anyhow, um, I just am still thrilled with the prospect of working on a tree. I've got all these ones like I was pointing out. You know, I really anxious to get that guy worked on, but ah, I'm working on this guy or I'm putting this one in the rock and it's kind of, you know, it's preemptory just because of the timing. You've got to get it done yeah. at a certain time. And I'd love to hollow out that beech tree now, but now the leaves are out and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to shower them with this, these chips and it sticks to them. Mm -hmm. And then you try to wipe them and they're tender and you're going to knock them all off. And that's right. a little more pruning than you suggested, you know. Just take a, you know, cut them in half, maybe or two thirds. Right. Anyhow, so delays are built into this art form, but having such an abundance of things. Now, I just spent an hour pruning on this one that I had planted in a rock four years ago and I hadn't pruned it. It was a pine. And um, it seems to be quite happy in this rock, except that it doesn't produce any needles longer than this, even without pruning. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, but it's starting to get bushy. And some extensions on there that are linear, and you know, linear is the enemy, right? Yeah, that's good. You know, you got to have gnarly. So let's take that down to here or cut down to the last leaves because it's a black pine and mm -hmm. maybe that'll work, but it's not too critical because I could lose that and I've still got all right. of this. And I just love working through the older trees. People ask, well, what's your favorite tree? And it says, the one I'm working on. Sure. Because I'm revisiting this thing that I grew from seed and did this and this and this and had it in this guy's yard for a few years and finally here it is now growing in a rock and um, it's just endlessly energizing and exciting to me yeah and it kind of drives my wife nuts because there's there's very little out there that does as any kind of allure yeah for me now i i'm anxiously waiting for the opportunity to return to the gem show in Tucson, mm. which we haven't gone to for two or three years. And it always was a favorite thing because I get to drive through California. I get to drive through the Siskiyous. <laughs> I get to maybe come back through the Redwoods. I get mm -hmm. to visit all these things that are fabulous. I get to go past, um, what the hell is it, south of Sacramento, um, a, a gnarly, vineyards that big sign along the sure, road sure you know yeah yes i do and, and there and they exactly are exactly what you're i'm looking about. at those zinfandel, zinfandel old vines in yeah all old gnarly things yeah and i'd rather take old 99 in spite of its delays than i5 because i get to drive down i, I hear you. down that way and i hear you and go to and i want to go to the gem shows so maybe i can find another i found a vendor down there years ago and bought several uh, interesting stalactites. Well, these are sitting at, these so are sitting in the garden. So I've got this thing for stalactites. Yeah. I've got one behind you there. And, and, and explain that to me. Why is there a crystalline form in the middle of that stalactite? Now that's from, I got that in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but it was broken like that. And I thought, why is there a crystal in the middle of a stalactite? I don't get it. It's yeah. a sedimentary, goddammit. So why would there be that? Do you know? No. Oh, this is the mystery. Yeah, that's why I'm asking you. You're a learned <laughs> kind of guy. You know what? You know, I decided early on, although I have many interests, I wanted to be a master of one. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. You can disagree with me. Well, but not that one. Just all those other things that you haven't pursued. Yeah, but you're more diversified than that. You've I'm got a great I, I, presentation. I mean, I'm, I, I, know, try, just, I try to be. Yeah. I, I try to be. I think. I think it's very. One thing that I learned from Mr. Kimura, you know, when he was young in his career, he had muscle cars. He liked Italian fashion. He loved the Beatles. Wow. He made his own guitars. Yeah. He, yeah, but but it got neck down. It got neck down because the the more and more he focused on bonsai when he was a young professional, you know, he didn't have a huge garden. He didn't have, uh, you know, dozens of apprentices. He didn't, 
you know, that built, uh, that built as he had okay. success in the economic model of the Japanese bonsai world in the bubble period post-World War II. And I don't know, you know, like, uh, I asked him one time as an apprentice, you know, are you happy with that or do you regret it? You know, and he just said, you know, it, he said something to the effect of it, it, it is what it is. You know, and I, I never really understood if he was, he, he loved bonsai. That was the thing about Mr. Kimura. Mm -hmm. He's not like other bonsai professionals in Japan where once they have a garden and apprentices, they stop working on bonsai and their apprentices do all the work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kimura was there. Always doing it. Always doing it, every yeah. day. And I thought that was really, that, that just, that this ga just gave impressive. me. impressive, yeah. That's why he is who he is. Yeah. Um, but I'd always got the feeling that he didn't have regrets, and I appreciated that too. You know, so not having muscle cars anymore and having yeah. a practical car and not playing guitar and trying to be a Beatle, but focusing on doing bonsai to the best of his ability, that appealed to me. That's why I went to study with him because, um, you know, I'm interested in geology. I love rock. I love yeah. rock. I don't know if I love rock as much as you love rock, but I would say very close if, yeah. it, you know, and, uh, and I love trees and I love the understory plants and I love the landscapes of, of the world, particularly North America, I think is absolutely special yeah. and unique on a level that the rest of the world uh, doesn't we'll seem to have. Yeah. 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 But, but, but I, you know, this miniaturized, this medium of the miniaturized tree contextually representing all of the things that exist within our relationship in the landscape. That, that is the singularity that, uh, that fascinates me most. Mm -hmm. it, and I think it is obviously so diversified because it starts to take you into all of the tangential offshoots of that. But, but it always comes back to the same thing for me. You yeah. know, this, 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 this is what binds me to you and mm -hmm. to other people that I otherwise wouldn't have a knowledge of exposure mm -hmm. to or a, a, a manner in which we open a conversation. And I find that to be really interesting, yeah. you know? Yeah, it is. So for, for the crystal and the stalactite, I too would be like, well, that's interesting, huh. but I don't have an answer for you. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you, so I had always suffered from the, uh, maybe a delusion or illusion that Kimura came, had a father who was, had access to a major industrial facility mm -hmm. and that delivered to him high pressure air mm. which he used to carve on a few trees where we're talking maybe 60,000 pounds on a thing mm -hmm. that would just erode the wood away leaving the knot because mm -hmm. he's I remember seeing one of his trees in one of his books that I looked at that and said, that's the only way you could do that. Yeah. To leave those little hard knots. And it just, and I, I just dreamed of this, having this thing and just. Mm -hmm. And, and I, somehow I, I had heard or something that his father was a major industrialist that had some kind of a plant that might have that kind of a compressor that he somehow had access to. And so that he came from some semblance of loot. Um, and any, any help with that or is that all yeah, well, I'll, dreaming I'll, from Dan Robinson? Well, I think, I think that I have to be very careful because I don't know that anybody actually knows the truth about Mr. Kimura's background. But mm -hmm. here is what I know. His father died when he was, I believe, nine years old. Wow. Okay. And there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different hypotheses, hi, hi, hypotheses yeah. about what happened to his father. Mm, okay. I don't know what's true. Yeah, let the mind amble. Well, right? his, fa his father was a phenomenal inventor. Oh. Who created one of the original models of the microphone, which is in the microphone museum. Hmm. Uh, he also created the original direct drive turntable for record wow. players, yeah. and uh, and it is, it has been said by Mr. Kimura that his father invented the original timing mechanism that allowed the gun to shoot between the propellers of warplanes. Wow! And uh, and I think that invention potentially led to his father's demise, and I don't know how, but yeah. that's what I've that's the wow. the way that I've heard it, and I think that that's fairly probably fairly accurate. Wow. So 
Mr. Kimura from nine until 16, when he lost his father, he had three sisters and his mother uh, was the sole, I think, money earner in the family oh, a, 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 okay. as a paper route. Wow. And when he was 16. Sounds familiar, I had those two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, and so the at Wisconsin 16. Wisconsin State Journal when I lived oh, in really? Wisconsin. Oh God, that sounds cold. <laughs> it was because sounds... I'd moved there from from the San Fernando Valley. Oh geez, yeah, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and then sixteen, he started his apprenticeship. Uh, so Mr. Kimura okay. Okay. did uh, have massive air compressors that would uh, sandblast trees. Okay. But he used a very special blasting medium to accomplish the aesthetic that okay. he was able to elicit in the wood of the trees. And actually, when I was the apprentice there, I never saw him use his blasting cabinet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I saw all of the equipment. I saw these massive yeah. uh, compressors and whatnot. Never once saw them turned on. And he had said to me early in my apprenticeship, he said, listen, if you can turn and he had all of these samples of wood mm -hmm. where the base of it would be how it started and then and the then tip of it would be the pro the product the after product sample. Of the and he said if you can do this to any tree you devalue the trees that have the most value and so he pulled back and he stopped doing it and he and i actually helped him dismantle his entire blasting cabinet when wow. i was apprentice wow. uh, everybody else had had quit i was the only apprentice uh in my third year yeah. for nine months and and we dismantled his blast cabinet uh and and had it hauled off i'll be darned yeah yeah so i never so saw it happen. somehow his conscience uh, or his reverence for existing trees and yeah I think his reverence. What do you think that was about? I mean, you're just dealing with the dead wood. Well, he might have been dealing with live wood. I mean, you're sandblasting the thing, but you could, yeah, you could fend it off if you're just dealing with the dead wood. Or... If I had to hypothesize, I imagine it would come down to value. Because if you devalue the most expensive trees as a professional, that you make your living. Uh, designing and selling. So he's dealing with really valuable trees rather than creating them. Well, I think I mean, if you create more and more trees of the same character, the value mm -hmm. of each tree dec decreases. I don't know, but he did tell me, uh, he did tell me, he said, if there's nothing special between a domestic piece of material and a piece of Yamadori, then bonsai as an economy does not exist. And that, that wow. made sense to me. It's such a deep, I mean, it's almost like a confounding concept. I just kind of, hmm, well. But the way that you make your living in bonsai and the way that a Japanese professional makes their living are so different that they're almost not the same thing anymore, well, you yeah. know? Yeah. And we're blessed. Yeah. I do have to say, we're blessed, and you and I talked yeah. about this earlier, we're blessed by the fact that we do not have a singular source of economics that provides or funds our, our existence. You know, mm -hmm. the Kokufu model is what created the box of aesthetics that requires trees to now follow yeah. the same artistic, artistic yeah. yeah, artistic criteria and demands and expectations of the of tapering trunk, that, yeah. the scarless, no gin on on broadleaf yeah. trees. Yeah. You know that is all built by a convention from the Kokufu model, and from my perspective, post World yeah. War II. Yeah, you know where all of a sudden, like post World War II, you have this massive yeah. external input into what was otherwise a what, closed country yeah. and a closed culture. And now there's a need to define what is this culture? What is this mm. undefined thing, this unknown entity in the, in the greater world now that it's open? And I think that that really forced Japanese bonsai, and I can't speak for any other endeavor, but when you look at the books and you see the change of aesthetics and, and, and the development of the economy, it forced Japanese bonsai to neck down that definition mm -hmm. to an understandable set yeah, of rules yeah. you know and i think that's honestly what we got yeah you know when we think about Sorry, the word. orthodox form of left right back yeah you yeah. know satiata kaishiata yeah and then the and then the branch for depth that was a necking down yeah you aren't kidding so it, it's and that 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 to me that's another aspect of you know where your perspective exists because you were really there for oh. the original. You were you were there when Her you were you were in Anaheim in '84, and you've got 
I saw pictures of Mr. Kimura's trip because you guys were there together at the mm-hmm. same convention, and I saw what Benoki's backyard looked like and Harry Harrow's backyard looked yeah. like. And jo- because Mr. Kimura had film shots of all of those gardens, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm yeah. thinking, gosh, it didn't look like that in 2000 when I was in college. They didn't look <laughs> like that. No. That was a different generation. They'd already kind of hit their peak. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it was different at that point. I remember... Uh, I had been selected to be in his workshop in L.A. I ran into him both times, San Francisco and L.A., and I had taken this tree down. They they hadn't said that they were providing trees. Mm. And so I said, oh, I've got this great tree. I'm going to go down there and see what he thinks. Yeah. You know, and so I am down there, and I come walking in with this tree on a cart and and he just about walks out because suddenly here, here I am <laughs> right with a tree to work on and he's got all these other ones that he's picked it out these uh, junipers probably from Harry right you know these lesser trees and I just demurred I said well there's alternatives I I thought I could have my own tree here at this right this thing and uh I I did ask to talk with him a little bit about it and and I sh- you know we looked at it and I said well my whole thing was whether I should split it and have make two trees out of it or do some kind of deal like that and yeah he thought it'd be better to keep it together and so everything was fine but it really created an uproar at the convention because uh, and I've always done that see yeah. every place I go somehow I seem to Put foot in mouth Get somebody or put off. foot in the air or <laughs> kick somebody in the ass or something. <laughs> and uh, the same thing happened at a convention in Minneapolis when uh, Nakamura, who was this uh-huh. visiting big, tall Japanese guy who was the the sensei for the for the Chicago group for years, and um, there was this great pine that Masi Mizumi. Uh, inherited from the, the the world convention or something in 1910 in San Francisco where the Japanese exhibit had this 200 year old black pine bonsai that they would brought over for it and it had this big trunk like this and yeah. he, he wound up getting that tree and had it and it just had this shitty design to it. I mean, it's a wonderful tree. It's an amazing tree. But it just had yeah. these bottom branches that uh, that go across the trunk. Mm-hmm. And he took that tree to the convention that was in Minneapolis. And we all had trees there, but Nakamura saw that tree and said, I want to groom this for you at the convention to just kind of clean it up a little bit. And so it was a spontaneous kind of a open workshop for people. and so. I'd been up earlier that day collecting larches up in the north end of, uh, up near Duluth or something. I came down and this thing was going on and I look in the room and there's a seat right next to John Naka in the, in the front row. And so I just kind of, well, hey, I'll walk in here. And there was all over the floor with prunings off this tree where he'd been thinning it down. And it still had, see, it has twin trunks. Do you yeah. know the one I mean? I do. You know, yeah. the trunk's maybe this big and the main one here. and. Here's this lesser one, and then there's two branches off of this lesser one that come across the trunk, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so he's pruned all this other stuff off, and here's these goddamn branches crossing the line of the trunk, you know? And so I, you know, I'm sitting here looking at that saying, well, what's the deal? How come we're leaving those guys on there, which is kind of a repudiation of all of our notions that branches shouldn't cross the line of the trunk, and here's two of them, and, right. or something like that. and. So finally, I, you know, I ask him about it, and um, and he says, "Well, it's the oldest branch on the tree." I said, "Well, the the next oldest one is right next to it, going the right direction. I mean, it's only that far off on the trunk. Uh, why would you leave that?" And he said, "Well, you'll have to come to Japan to my house, and we'll talk about it." Well, that kind of got me going a little bit, you know. I thought, uh, you know, we're in here to learn. <laughs> yeah stuff and yeah, I really sure. think a dialogue might help because I'm sure other people are thinking about it and I even John Nako is sitting there and he's just kind of smiling and I I picked up his notepad and, and stepped up there and 
put the paper over the branch to show people how it looked without it. And, and Mossy Mazuma, he jumps up thinking I'm going to break the branch off or something. So it creates this uproar. Oh, again. wow. And, you oh, know, yeah. Finally, I just go, OK, you know, so I demur and I go outside and then these ladies come out. Oh, you just can't talk to these Japanese people that way. You know, it's just I said, come on, get off of it. We're here to learn stuff. And sure. here we're, I'm trying to understand why you would leave those, even if it is one year older than the, the branch next to it that's in the right position. Why would you leave this one that crosses the line of the trunk? And, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no resolution, but, is it, but but isn't this interesting though? You know, because uh, I heard about that. Uh, I heard heard about that scenario. That's, Was it basically like that? I it's mean, part. That I mean, it's part. Yeah, you kind of heard about it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's part of bonsai lore in North America. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's certainly part of Dan I, Robinson I, lore, I know. right? You know, which is like, which is interesting because there's two sides to every story, uh, and I think that there there was this notion and has been a notion that. You know, the reverence is to not ask questions, but then you look at the Japanese bonsai model in Japan as an apprentice, you don't challenge your master, yeah. you know, and your master doesn't explain to you why it's, it's, a, it's a learn through observation mm -hmm. style of education. And so I started to recognize in Japan, and Mr. Kimura was an exception because Mr. Kimura after his apprenticeship and before he became a professional, there was a five-year period of time where there was some conflict that existed that prevented him from being a bonsai professional. Wow. Uh, with the way that his apprenticeship ended and his relationship with his master, etc. And so he went to horticulture school at night. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where Mr. Kimura, the magician, was born was because he physiologically started to understand how to execute how these. Really yes, then. that's correct. He understood their vascular systems. He started understanding the nuances of controlling sugar and starch loads. Yeah. And, and he really could tell you why. And that's what made him such a profound force in the West. Yeah. You know, whether he wanted well, to share that so information yeah. or not, right? And, yeah. but, you know, do, did these other bonsai professionals from Japan actually know why mm -hmm. you know or did were they versed in the in the uh the skill set of explaining and I think that that right, was right not an that, exercise yeah. muscle so Mr. Nakamura you know my experience with the Japanese bonsai approach is that there are a lot of there are a lot of moments where you know humility or restraint are shown based on that reverence for age or generational decisions that have been made that the individual would not override the group consensus that this branch has existed as mm -hmm. the oldest branch on the tree. And Mr. Nakamura is sitting there saying, it's the oldest branch on the tree, but he can't, maybe couldn't at that time explain more than that, you know? Yeah. But as Westerners, we're saying, hey, we wanna there understand this I mean, thing. Yeah. I wanna understand the decision that you're making, and he can't say, listen, 20 other hands, this tree's 200 years old. This is the 1915 Pan American tree yeah. that's been donated in Mossy, you know, and I'm just touching yeah. this as one of 30 hands that has, you know, that's hard for both cultures to be able to understand each other enough to dialogue about. And I think that's where we start to see modern bonsai breaking through the cultural mm -hmm. barrier. Right. Yeah, I like to think so too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, I think finally you can. <laughs> there's an explanation. Yeah. There's a, a a greater understanding. There's a slight degree of explanation, but also, you know, Dan, it's imperative that you did that. I, that's also yeah. what I want to say is important because there is a spirit in that that you asking that question when others were wondering and abiding by the, an assumed uh, convention. Yeah. You were breaking through that ice. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were like that ship that crushes through, yeah. you know, the frozen ocean. Yeah. Trying the to get breaker, so. Yeah, you, know. you, 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 you were that guy. Yeah, thank which, you. <laughs> which I do have to say is not always the enviable position because that's a hard, that's a hard, durable path. Well, to, to piss off everybody <laughs> is the deal. 
Yeah. But you didn't intend to do that, or did no. you? No. You just wanted the I question wanted answered, right? You wanted to know. I go, what's the, what's the rationale? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just a goddamn branch. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, and why really, can't we ask, it'd right? It'd be real interesting as a, as a gin. Sure. Crossing that thing as a remnant. Sure. And beautify this thing instead of this clutter with this gob of foliage over here that comes from over here and yeah crosses are you familiar with the tree i don't know where oh it's at the um the it's at collection Oakland, north it? yeah it's at collection yeah. north i haven't seen it in a long time i know you know moss had it and i know boone had done some work prior to prior to bonsai today going out of business yeah. and moving to europe to bonsai focus i know that there was an article and then you know, I've seen it a couple times, but, yeah. but uh, I don't think it's being grown very well. I think it's too dense. But this is probably what he was thinning out anyhow. Yeah, I maybe. I don't know. You know, I really don't know that. I would say if there's there's, you know, two or three trees in all of North America that I would love to touch. That's that's number one or number two. Yeah. Yeah, because I just think that's a tree that that has a true mixture of oh, these. Yeah. You know, this this got this this history in Japan came to the United States, history in the United States, multiple hands, several yeah. interpretations, undeniable provenance. Yeah. Like that, that's the kind of piece of material yeah. that really Well, it demands. personifies the whole deal. I mean, this is, that's a great tree. It's, it, uh, it's, a, it, it's a living illustration of the, uh, of the journey, yeah. of, of the journey that Bonsai and has it's, taken and in its transition. We're, we're perpetuating it, taking good care of it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, for you know, for you, you're a tree maker, and that's a yeah. and that's a and that's a big that's a big deal because when uh, 2012 ABS in Denver, Colorado, and you reworked, did you rework? You no, know, you worked Athuya. You did the demonstration on the Alaskan, not Athuya, but Alaskan cedar, yeah. right? When did you rework the Hollywood juniper from the '84 Anaheim convention that you? Uh, that was in, that was out in Palm Springs. And um, that was at the GSPF event. It had to event. be about uh, 2010 or yeah, something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah, was a big the, deal. That was a big deal. I, yeah, the Hollywood juniper from Melba Tucker's yard. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, it's in my book. Uh, yeah, no, I know, the, but all the time. But I remember. But I had just come back from Japan. I remember that being the focal point and Ted and I had talked because I was I was yeah, working was, a little uh, bit with him. He was him. heading towards the curatorship yep. there yep. away from Ben Oakey. Which, yeah. Is he still? Is, Ted is still yeah. Ted's still curating. I think he's done an amazing job with the yeah. Huntington. I just have so much respect for Ted. He's a big mentor of mine. He's done a lot for me in, yeah, in my career. Yeah, I, I really like him and I was glad that he got the job because I never thought Ben Oakey was well, he was Ben Oakey, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. And he did stuff, but it, I'll never forget him working on that tree at the Golden Jubilee, where he cut off all the branches on the back and said, "You want to put this in the back so you don't see the scars." I thought there was a pine of some sort, you mm -hmm. know. That, that. Oh man, mm -hmm. that could be the best part of the tree, mm -hmm. the dead wood, instead of cutting them all off and leaving around yeah. pruning scars running down the back. And, yeah. Of course, that's when he had said that dead wood was inappropriate on deciduous trees too and yeah the silver jubilee that was celebrating the california bonsai society which was the one that preceded the golden state and um and that was like an invitation only club right yeah that had a certain yeah. level of and so the guys got together and made the golden state federation which opened up to everybody and and disassembled quite a few of the um the groups that were dominated by the Japanese only, and mm -hmm. and uh, that was all, I think, in the mid '70s. I guess Ed Ed uh, Fisher, no, Fisher was the name of the guy who collected the ball cypress trees. This guy used to go across the Tamiami Trail, the ditches on either side of it, west of Miami, to collect ball cypress trees, and he used two big wash tubs and a pole to pull himself across the ditch. <laughs> and he just pulled the buckets up, would go out and just cut them off at ground level. Holy throw cow. Throw them across the, the ditch and then took them home and took, treated them like cuttings and they all grew from them down there. I Unbelievable. Mean, yeah. Heat and humidity. But, yeah. That's the gift that Ed keeps on Fisher. giving. Yeah, I bought a whole, my 50 or 60 of those 
things, and he sent them to me in a big refrigerator box. Yeah. Shipped, shipped a whole bunch of them here. I, st I don't have one of them today, but none of them liked it up here. And I still have had many bald cypress that I've collected that hadn't survived, and yet I've got some that have. So yeah. It's hard to... I know you've got a cluster of them in that shed yeah. when I was down at your place. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, we, we are got... Are they all pond cypress or mine are all pond cypress? Some of them are ponds, some yeah. of them are bald. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, if they come out of New Orleans, then they're going to be bald cypress. Sure. you got to be northern Florida, and the great ones are down in the southern swamps down sure. there. Sure, so. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting deal. Talk, talking with you helps helps me understand and I had this I had this realization when I was talking with David Easterbrook of just how freaking hard it must have been to try and do bonsai in the 1950s when the information was not abundant it didn't uh, slow you down at all no it didn't well, I was just you were in your element in the wind you were in your element digging up trees and, you were loving it yeah you were in it yeah God. but I didn't have any aspirations to for it to go anywhere it was just my own curiosity just enjoyment, and energy and love man look at this stuff yeah and so i have you ever felt yeah. pressure have you ever felt pressure for it to go somewhere i mean you built a land and gardens like it no the only thing that i i had these delusions when i got into it maybe before or when i came home from korea i'm not sure that this art form is just going to be fabulous and it's going to take over the world yeah i mean i was that effusive about it just I didn't have anybody to tell because I'm living down here in the country but like I said I I live out in the woods so I'm not a member of a club or yeah. anything else and so I'm just talking to myself or Diane but I I and I just felt that this was just a wonderful thing for people to be involved with and growing trees and training them into interesting forms and all this kind of stuff was was going to sweep the world and then like I said the cell phone in the early 80s just kind of killed it all off smashed your hopes and dreams yeah <laughs> so then i came down to reality and said well okay this is just a personal kind of a hobby and <laughs> i'll keep collecting me. this stuff and uh, yeah. doing what i do but it's hard to compete with modern electronics and uh, that's more interesting and so yeah. club membership dropped off in every field you know whether it's golfing or anything else it just all kind of dried up because that's that machine is just magical yeah it takes you to the every place in the world instantly and yeah you don't have to do any work to get there and oh that's really nice yeah and then for me as kind of a production guy it's just like you you just have energy you want to do something yeah and um, so it's that's the way it turned out we wound up doing stuff <laughs> but what it's, what happens to a land and moving forward? Well, I don't know. My wife and I, you know, we conjure on how that's going to evolve. I, you know, one of my notions is, well, uh, the city is probably take it over the property. Mm -hmm. It's theirs. Mm -hmm. It's a park, not the bonsai in it necessarily. That's kind of my stuff. Yeah. How the kids. None of them are really bonsai type people, but they all love it and enjoy my enthusiasm for it. It's a catching thing. Mm -hmm. And they're all part of it on some level. And yeah. so all of that really works. But um, it'd be nice to have it go on. I mean, it's a beautiful place and it all depends on how high the tide gets. Yeah. I mean, that may be the factor that changes everything for everybody. <laughs> the uncontrollable Starting factor. tomorrow, yeah. right? Suddenly, oh, best laid plans. Yeah. You know, we'll put it all on a barge and let it float up and down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'd be, the experience yeah. changes entirely. Start injecting styrofoam into the ground <laughs> right. down there so that when the tide <laughs> comes up, it just kind of floats up and down. That's right. Tether it. And there you go. <laughs> those rocks. Well, it's not as big as it was. Well, it'll be back later yeah, this exactly. afternoon. And yeah. <laughs> You could build some sort of a dike around it or something, you know? Yeah. Bulkhead. Get, a, get away you know, with mirrors so you can still see the water. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of... Um, 
That's a complex thing, it right? Because you, you built something it grand, and it's, and it's, it's it's really a wonderful place, and people love it, and they've never seen anything like it, and that just reassures me that it's an unusual and great thing and worthy. But how, what to do with it, and how to? I'm really kind of up to it. Mm -hmm. Still taking care of it, and I get a few volunteers every once in a while. I, I've just never really been good at all the organizational stuff. I mean, I marvel at all of this that you do. I don't do this. Well, that's the, th that's whatever. the thing. That's where, you know? don't give me too much credit. Well, you know, hey, look at this. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I call somebody and how about helping me prune this pine on Saturday, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so Kyle shows up on Saturday and Patty shows up on Sunday and uh -huh. sometimes maybe two other people come in and visit and then they they say, yeah, we'd like to volunteer and help you. Well, maybe those. I said, well, call before you come. Make sure I'm here. And sure. But uh, nothing organized. Uh, the warehouse thing is much better organized, but they've got a staff. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, the only staff I have is someone that I don't ever want to put the staff to, and that's Diane. Yeah. Because she does everything with that store and all the... Uh, all the machinations and all the communication with you, that's her. Yeah. She's, you know, I'm... Yeah, she's incredible. I'm, I'm busy pruning trees, and so yeah. I, don't, I don't know what's going on. What, what's the schedule? Sure. <laughs> so, but I'm real good w with taking care of my clients and the prunings and all of that kind of stuff. But um, long term, it's a little bit hard to know just how everything's going to play out. Um, yeah. I know there's great trees here that people would love to have on some level, and so maybe that is what happens long term. The land is there. What would what, you want to have happen with it all, though? You know, I mean, like, if you just had, and maybe you don't know, and if that's the case, totally fine, but, like, you know, if you had your dream scenario, I'm assuming a land and lives on as opposed well, to it, it being ideally dissolved. Ideally, that would right? happen. Yeah, sure. And so that I'm glad you're here because this is our chance to talk about your role and <laughs> my role and moving away from that goddamn place that you live in along that <laughs> ugly river that yeah. splits the land in half. How dare it. And you've just got little meager trees around you. I've I know. Some I know. Great, you know. I know. I can't even tell you how how uh, you know, exciting and tempting that is. But let me just say, because I think we're about ready to get rain, thank you. Thank you for sitting down with us, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, we've known each other kind of vicariously. and just, Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. How are you doing? And, you know, I pick up a tree after you've gone to all the effort to dig it back and do all this sure. stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, God, great stuff. Oh, I got to go. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Great <laughs> to see is, you. All right. This is more fun. Yeah. I like it.